part one of this lab, which is a separate video, was meant to be the easiest possible lab to verify the loop rule and the junction rule. This is part two, which is harder. So this is the problem we're going to try to solve uh, and compare theory and experiment. This can be done as uh, simply a textbook problem. Uh, in fact, it is a textbook problem, but we're going to also act it out in real life. So we have this complicated circuit consisting of a battery and a bunch of resistors. And uh, this is sort of the simplest circuit you can make out of a bunch of equal resistors so that it's not possible to break it down into parallel and series parts. So a lot of circuits that are a resistor network like this, uh, you can say, oh, well, there's a parallel part inside a series part, and that series part is in parallel with some other part. It has that hierarchical structure. This one doesn't have that hierarchical structure. You can't kind of slice it along some line and break it down into smaller parts. So the only way to solve this is by directly using the loop rule and the junction rule. Now, if you think what it would be like to try to directly measure all of the voltages and currents in this circuit, uh, the voltages are pretty easy. You just bring in the two probes of your voltmeter like that, for instance, to measure the voltage drop across that resistor. But the currents would be ugly. Uh, you would have to, let's say you wanted to measure the current through this resistor, you would have to, let's say, break open the circuit right here by breaking a connection, insert the ammeter, measure the current, and then put it back together. Doing that all those times at all those different parts of the circuit would be a real pain. So we're going to use a trick that's going to allow us to avoid having to do anything that hard. So to demonstrate this technique for measuring currents effectively by actually just measuring voltages, I'm going to go back to this simpler circuit from the first part of this lab. This, la this circuit is actually this. And in the previous part of the lab, we measured those currents at the green dots marked 1, 2, and 3. It was pretty laborious. We had to break the circuit at every single one of those points and insert the, the meter in the circuit, then uh, put the circuit back together again. So in a circuit like this, where it's basically just a big resistor network, there's a trick for avoiding that because the current and the voltage are not really independent things. So if you know the resistance and you can measure the voltage, then you can find the current. So looking at the color codes on all of these resistors, this one here is a 10K resistor. This one here is a 1K resistor. And this one here is also a 10K resistor. So those are the resistance values. And now I'm just going to measure all of the currents, but by measuring voltages instead, and then really indirectly inferring the currents. So now I have my meter set up as a DC voltmeter. I measure the voltage drop across resistor number 1, and I get 4.615 volts. Then I measure the voltage drop across resistor number 2, and I get 0 0.415 volts. And finally, I measure the voltage drop across resistor number 3, and I get 0 0.415 volts. And actually, I've been ignoring all the minus signs. Uh, they're all actually downhill this way. The fact that I get the same voltage drop across both that resistor and that resistor isn't a coincidence. I can tell that that has to happen if I apply the loop rule to that loop. So that was a lot easier than having to take apart the circuit three times and put it back together again to insert an ammeter. If I go ahead and use Ohm's law, I equals delta V over R for each resistor, I get those three currents shown in red. 
and I can see just as we did in the direct measurement of the current that this current coming into the junction is the same as the sum of these two currents coming out of the junction. So now I'm just finishing up soldering together a real world version of that circuit. This is meant to be compact and easy to work with. And the only difference between this and the circuit in the problem is that if you look at the color codes, you can see that they're brown, black, red, which means that these are all one kilo ohm resistors. That means that uh, we have to uh, add a, a power of 10 to the third in all of our currents compared to all of our voltages. So if we measure an actual current of 1 milliamp, we're just going to pretend that that's an amp. Now I've got my circuit hooked up to a power supply, which is off screen where you can't see it and I've dialed up one volt on that power supply. I can check that that's right by measuring that voltage right there. So it's reading 1.012 volts, which is as close as I could dial up on the power supply. The goal in this problem is to find the power in the circuit, and the power is simply going to equal the amount of current drawn from the power supply multiplied by one volt. So in fact, numerically, the power just equals the current drawn from the power supply. And I'm going to check that against reality so that we have some, something to check our calculations against. But in fact, this is going to be the only current I ever actually measure in the circuit. It would be impractical to measure all these other currents, for one thing, because I've soldered this thing together, so I can't break those connections. So I'm going to switch the, the meter to microamps, put the wire in the microamps plug, switch from AC to DC, and we'll see if this overloads the meter on the microamp scale or not. So I break the circuit over here on the right. I'm not worrying about the sign here. I know that current's actually flowing to the right in the circuit. And I get 798 microamps as my current. So now when we try to analyze all of this, we're going to need some symbols for things. So I've introduced some notation here. I've got capital B for battery, which is actually a, a power supply in real life here. And then I've labeled the resistors uh, C, D, E, F, G, and H, like that. And you could say, well, what do these variables actually correspond to in terms of physical measurements? Uh, you could say that there are the voltages across these batteries, which I do actually, those are the things I actually intend to measure directly with a voltmeter. So we know that downhill is that way. So when I put a voltmeter on there with the positive plug there and the common plug there, I'll get a positive number, which is the distance from this uphill side of that resistor to the downhill side of that resistor, some number of volts. However, we're pretending these are all one volt, uh, sorry, one ohm resistors. So if I find that the voltage across that resistor is some value, then uh, it actually, I can actually call that also the current through that resistor, because for a one ohm resistor, the voltage and the current are numerically equal. They just have different units. Uh, there is the issue that it wouldn't be practical to build this thing out of one ohm resistors. Uh, if I did that, for instance, the wires would have had too much resistance and would have messed things up compared to the resistors. So in reality, all of the resistors are 1,000 ohms, but we're just going to pretend they're 1 ohm resistors. And the only place that, that causes any issue is that in that current that I just measured right over here, I measured it to be 798 microamps. I'm just going to pretend that's 798 milliamps, and that is basically the answer to our problem. So we're trying to figure out where does that mystic number 0.798 amps come from from mathematical analysis. So our goal is going to be to find that 0.798 as some exact mathematical uh, number that we could have predicted before we did the experiment. So now you might want to go ahead and 
sketch that circuit, write down all the notations so that uh, when I start measuring all these things, you don't get lost. And the point of measuring all these is that as you start solving all of the math, you can use these measurements to check whether you're actually getting equations that are true. You can just plug in formulas, plug in numbers into the formulas, and see if those formulas are correct. So I've got the voltmeter back in volts mode again. And I'm going to measure the voltage across the battery. which is 1.016 volts, which, which is as close to one volt as I could get it. And remember, this thing, capital B, is the only quantity here that really is not both a voltage and a current. The current was 798 microamps, uh, or 0.798 milliamps, if we're pretending these are all one ohm resistors. Uh, so B is not the, uh, the voltage. B is only the current there. And so I, what I just measured was the voltage, the current was what I previously measured with the real amp, uh, ammeter. So now I'm going to measure C. And I get 0.468 volts. D, 0.077 volts. E, having trouble getting good contact there, 0.548 volts, F, 0.391 volts, G, 0.313 volts, and H, 0.312 volts. So now it's really up to you how to analyze the data, but I'm going to give you some guidance. Um, actually, you can do the entire calculation without ever appealing to any of the readings from the meter. And so you wouldn't actually need any of the, the voltages that I measured across any of the resistors. And at the end, you could just compare with the current you found with the current that we measured right here. And since it's a one volt power supply, that's numerically the same as the power that we were trying to find. Um, and, however, it's useful to have all the data as a check because then when you find an equation, you can check whether it's true. So I'm going to uh, give you examples of uh, one of the junction rules you have to write down and one of the loop rules you have to write down and of how you would check that you've got those right by plugging in data. So there are five junctions in the circuit. One, two, three, four, and then a trivial junction between G and H, where there's just one current flowing in and one current flowing out. So that's five total junctions. Uh, as an example, I'm going to analyze the one right here for you. So all the currents are flowing to the right on this diagram. That means that current F has to equal D plus G. So you could write down that equation, F equals D plus G. And then if you wanted to check that that equation was right, you could plug in the meter readings. Now the meter readings were really voltages, but because these are one ohm resistors, uh, that's the same as the currents in units of amps. And if you do that, F equals 0.391 amps. And if we add the readings for D and G, we get 0.390 amps. So we're basically getting perfect agreement there to within rounding errors on the meter. Now of those five junctions, they're not all independent. To refresh your memory about how this kind of works in math, uh, say I have those two equations. So you might look at those two equations and if your math teacher told you determine x and y from those equations, you might say, oh, okay, I can find x and y. Um, and you would think that would work because it's two equations with two unknowns and usually two equations with two unknowns gives you uh, a unique solution. But these two equations are not independent. You can take the first equation and just multiply it by 2 and get the second equation. So if you know the first equation already, the second one is not giving you any new information. In the same way, we have the, the five junction rules in the circuit. They're not all independent. 
And in fact, if you pick any four of them, you'll get all of the information that you're going to get from the junction rules. So take the one that I took and then pick four other ones, or sorry, three other ones. Doesn't matter w which other three you take. So that'll give you four equations for four junction rules. So if we're keeping score here, we've got four junction rules. And we also have seven unknowns. So the seven unknowns are B, C, D, E, F, G, and H. So there's our score so far. So you could write down those four junction rules and then start to manipulate them and do algebra. That would be really pointless because you can't solve four equations in seven unknowns. So we need three more equations and they better be equations that are independent of the ones we've already found. So the way we're going to get three more equations is we're going to use the loop rule. And there are many loops you could do in the circuit. There are way more than three, actually, but they're not all really independent. So I could do the bottom loop, which goes through the battery and through those three resistors. I could do this loop, which is like a rectangle. I could do this upper left hand loop. I could do the outside loop. I could do uh, a loop like this where I go through these resistors. There are lots of possibilities, but they're not all really independent. So we're just going to pick three of those and, uh, and write those down. So the first one that I'm going to pick is this upper left small one. And so the idea with the loop rule is that if you're dropping downhill by a certain height as you go from here down to here, that's the same height drop you'd have to do if you went down F and then down D. So that loop rule tells us that C equals F plus D. So you could write down that equation, C equals F plus D. And then if you're not sure if it was right, you could say, OK, I'll check it using the data. So C was 0.468 volts. And when we add F and D, we get 0.468 volts. So again, the agreement with the loop rule is exact to within the rounding error on the meter. Uh, in principle, it doesn't really matter what other loops you pick in this circuit. I'm just going to make a suggestion, which is that you take uh, this one and this one in addition. So in other words, the smallest three loops that you can make. And those are all independent. And just watch out, because even though this is labeled B at the bottom, remember, B is the component in this circuit where its voltage and its current are not numerically equal to each other. B's voltage is 1. So when you do this bottom loop, don't pretend that B's voltage is B. B's voltage is 1. Now to help you organize your thoughts, I'm just going to give you some suggestions about how to keep things from getting confusing. So. So far, we wrote down our first junction rule and our first loop rule. You're going to do uh, three more junction rules and two more loop rules. So that will make a total of seven equations and seven unknowns. And I would put a box around those to keep track of what you're doing. And so you've got your initial set of equations. And there, is, there are no meter readings or anything in there. It's all, all just variables. Uh, don't start muddying up your beautiful equations with the ugly numbers. Just use the numbers for a check if necessary. Then the next step uh, would be that you've got to pick a variable that you're going to eliminate. And I'll tell you what I would do, which is super easy. The trivial junction between G and H tells you that whatever current flows through G also flows through H. So actually, one of the equations in that box would probably be G equals H. Therefore, I'm going to use that. to eliminate G. And to keep track of what I'm doing, I'm going to say that in my paper and draw an arrow. And then in my new box, wherever I have a G, I'm going to write an H instead, because that's the expression that I've got now that replaces G. So of the two equations that I had already written down, the only place, the only one that had a G in it was this one. So I eliminated G in favor of H there. 
I've used up the g equals h equation, so if that occurred down here in this list, I'm getting rid of that now. That's not going to occur over here. It's been, it's been expended. So I'm going to have six equations now. Six equations and six unknowns. Might not be a bad idea to go through that box and check that there really are only six different symbols that occur in there. Those would be all the symbols on a list except for g, which is now dead. And then you just keep on going like that. So keep on, uh, pick your next variable that you want to eliminate, bring it down to five equations with five unknowns, and just keep on going. And don't eliminate b, because actually it's our goal, so it's easier if we just leave that as your last variable standing. And drawing the boxes and writing the arrows and all that really helps to keep things from getting confusing. And also I would check every single equation you ever write down, check it with the data and make sure it's right because it's very discouraging if you go through this whole process and then don't realize near the end, until near the end, that you've got an incorrect equation that contaminated all your algebra from early on. So at the end, you're going to have a single equation, which would be b equals something. It would be some simple expression. It's actually a, a fraction. And then you can check that fraction against the data. Uh, I found that it was OK agreement with experiment. Uh, it was off by maybe 5%, so not too bad.